Amen. Well, good morning. Go ahead, grab your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 14. Longest chapter in Mark. We're going to be in just the first 31 verses this morning. Now, some of the greatest pain we experience as humans is caused by those we are closest to, those we love, broken promises, um, being lied to, unkind words, selfishness. But is there anything more devastating in a relationship than betrayal? Some people have said, actually, that it's easier to deal with the loss of a loved one in death than it is to be betrayed by that person. And it's devastating because the ones that we love are usually the ones that we trust the most. And when that trust is broken, there's a long road to rebuilding that trust again. And betrayal can cause us to do some crazy things. If you've been betrayed, you know sometimes there's thoughts in your head that you didn't know could be there. Or it makes you want to do some things that you didn't quite think you'd ever do. And it can consume us. Consumes us. And many studies have shown that the first, the default mode we go to when we are betrayed is revenge. That's just where we go. I've got to get back at this person for their betrayal. And books and movies and TV and music are these themes of betrayal and people who are traitors um, is all over. One such traitor in literature, one of our family's favorites, is a man, or a kid, by the name of Edmund Pevensey. So if you pay attention to Chronicles of Narnia, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, we meet these four siblings. Edmund is one of them. And Edmund uh, gets into the land of Narnia. I'm, I'm assuming you guys know at least a little bit about this, so I don't have to go into all of Chronicles of Narnia. But they go into this wardrobe. He eventually gets into this land of Narnia, and he meets the White Witch on his first visit. And she's very interested in the fact that he's a human, and so they begin this conversation, and he ends up getting some things that he wants. One of them is Turkish delight. I've never had the pleasure, I don't know if it is a pleasure, but according to Edmund, it was a pleasure to have some Turkish delight. And after the tasting the food, he's he's drawn in. He's enchanted with this, what we know as the white witch. And he ends up, through all this, betraying his family on his next visit into Narnia. Not only betraying his family, but betraying Aslan, who we see is the rescuer in the story, he tells the White Witch everything, all the plans that Aslan's coming, this is where my family is. And he's been drawn in for some Turkish delight. He's been drawn in for the promise of royalty, the promise of power. And in our passage today, we have three scenes that are filled with betrayal, rejection, and denial. Three scenes. And it's scandalous in these scenes because the betrayal in every single one is against Jesus. The only one to never betray another person. A savior and a friend who has never broken anyone's trust. And so in these three scenes, we're faced with this choice this morning. This is the main point you see in the title of the sermon today. Is that when it comes to Jesus, we need to take him or leave him. And we're going to see this decision played out in these three different scenes in three different ways. When it comes to Jesus, we can sacrifice or sell out. We can participate or pass. And finally, we can depend on or we can disown. So let's look at the first one, sacrifice or sell out. Verses 1 through 11. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them any time you want, but you will not always have me. She, but she did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. So we have another sandwich this morning. 
If you haven't been with us with the Gospel of Mark, you're picking up online for the very first time. This is a writing style that Mark uses where he has this start of a story, the end of the story, and then in the middle is something that brings everything together, makes sense of the whole. And we have that right here in these 11 verses. He starts off with something, he ends with it, and in the middle helps to explain everything that is going on here. So it seems like an interruption, but in fact, it's going to explain a lot. So we start off with these religious leaders fuming over Jesus' teaching from the last few days in the temple. They are upset and plotting to kill him. Not the first time they plotted to kill him in the Gospel of Mark. And they're nervous, though, to do this. They know where he is, but they're nervous to do this because it's Passover, which means there's thousands upon thousands of other Jews in Jerusalem who have come to respect Jesus, um, revere him. They know that he's someone special. Maybe he's the Messiah. Maybe he's not. But he's done these wonders and these miracles. And so for them to arrest him could cause a riot. And they're probably right. And so their thought is, how can we arrest him discreetly? Okay, that's the first part. Go to the end, verses 10 through 11. Judas, one of the 12 disciples, Jesus' closest friends and followers, goes to the uh, religious leaders and says, I'll hand him over. I will betray Jesus. The one who was called by Jesus to follow him is now going to the religious leaders to betray Jesus to them. Now, this is good. Can they do this discreetly? Can they arrest Jesus? Yeah, they have one of the inner circle. They have the 12 disciples. And so if you think about it from a movie standpoint, because this has been a a storyline in a lot of movies, who betrays the president? Somebody on their staff, right? Somebody who's close, somebody who knows, oh, this is the president's schedule. This is where he's going to be. This is when he's going to be there. And everybody's always shocked that it's someone on the staff, someone close to them. But that's exactly what happens here. If we want to discreetly do this, we need somebody on the inside, and that's what they get with Judas. So there's promise of payment. We find out later that he sells Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, which is actually a pretty small sum of money, sort of like betraying siblings for Turkish delight. Now, why would, Jesus, or why would Judas, te- this is, there's Judas and John and Jesus. I'm going to mess that up today. Okay, just bear with me. Why would Judas team up with the other side? He's been following Jesus for three years. He's been standing with Jesus in every confrontation against the religious leaders. So why would he now go and betray the one he's been following? That's why we need verses 3 through 9. This is the middle of the sandwich. Jesus is in Bethany. We've already seen that Bethany was an important place for him. He was staying here on his pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And he's in the house of Simon the leper eating a meal. And Simon the leper, this is all we know of Simon the leper. His name was Simon and he was a leper. He was probably a healed leper, presumably by Jesus, because that's why everybody's eating with him. He's cleansed now. But he's known as Simon the leper to those who are reading this. And then a woman enters, doing something that culturally wasn't okay to do. It wasn't okay at this time for a woman to walk into a meal and go to the distinguished guest unless she was serving Okay, that wasn't okay at this point. So it would have drawn some eyes at this point. In the Gospel of John, this woman is identified as Mary, of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Okay, Jesus' three friends. So this is Mary, who is bringing now this expensive imported perfume, and she breaks this jar to anoint Jesus, to pour this perfume on him. And in Luke 7, there's a similar account, but it's similar names, but a different place and different situation. So here, at this moment, we have Mary. And apparently, this is some sort of designer perfume that you only get at the high-end stores in Jerusalem. Okay, this is, this is a big deal. Because the disciples are sitting there thinking, doing the calculations in their mind, thinking how big this jar is, and saying, what are you doing? You can sell that for a year's wages, a year. I don't know how many of us waste, you know, some, something one time purchase in a year where somebody looks at us and says, really? That's what you buy. A year's wages. And what happens is these disciples are indignant. We've seen this word before. It means that they're so angry they're flaring their nostrils. They're not just a little bit upset. They are indignant that she has done this. They tell her what you should have done with that possession is to sell it and give it to the poor. Now, here in Mark, we see that this is the disciples saying this. The Gospel of John gives us a little bit more information. It actually says that Judas was the one who led the rebuke 
of this woman. So maybe for the disciples, the motive of giving money to the poor was sincere. For Judas, though, we know it's not. We find out what Judas' motivation is, and you'll see it on the screen in John 12, 6. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. So Judas is thinking, we could have sold that, and I could have gotten my cut. He's the one who keeps the money, and he's been taking from it. Important, he's, ha- he's been having his heart hardened over time. Every time he reaches into that bag, his heart is hardening. So they try to make this woman feel bad about what she's done, and what they're saying in this moment is, you've wasted that on Jesus. Think about that for a moment. You've wasted that perfume on Jesus when you could, could have given that to somebody in need. So I don't know about you, but there's been a few times in my life where I've given something away or done something to the point where somebody says that's foolish. Or you've gone somewhere, maybe serving on the mission field, and somebody says that's foolish. Jesus, nothing is wasted when it's done for Jesus. Nothing is wasted. And here, what's done for him is this love and worship of giving everything she has, sacrificing what she has for Jesus. And this fact leads Jesus to rebuke the disciples. He says, she's done a beautiful thing to me. There's no waste. You can't waste anything of value on someone who's of infinite value. The perfume is the least she could do. He wants our very lives. She did what she could, very similar to Mark 12, where the uh, widow gives the two copper coins, which is all she had. Very similar language there. He's saying she did all she could. She gave what is most valuable to her for me. And it isn't bad that, you know, Jesus isn't upset that the disciples care about the poor, if in fact their motive is really truly for the poor. He's saying you're always going to have the poor with you. So you can care for them any time you want, but I'm going to be gone. I'm not going to be here in just hours, really. And so you can care for them, but what she has done in this moment is she has prepared me for burial. So they would prepare later on in John 19, Joseph of Arimathea goes and takes Jesus' body and they start to put um, myrrh and aloes on him to prepare his body for burial. So what's happening here? Jesus is saying, she's doing that right now. This is a symbol. She is preparing my body for burial. There's a deeper meaning here that I don't think Mary understood and the disciples certainly missed, but Jesus saw. She's getting me ready for what is to come. This is reality for him. So all that happens. Now, verses 10 through 11 make a little bit more sense. Judas has been stealing. Probably for all three years that he's been with Jesus. Maybe he's sick of wandering around and Jesus not meeting his expectations. Maybe he thinks there's supposed to be some power coming with his position when it doesn't seem like that's there. Whatever it was, though, it drove Judas mad enough in this moment to have her break that jar for Jesus and anoint him to go to the religious leaders and say, I can help you. I will betray him. But again, his heart has been hardening. Every time he reaches into that bag to take money out for himself, his heart has been hardened. And now his relationship with Jesus is to be used to his own advantage, for his own personal gain. I know Jesus and I can do something for myself here. He doesn't deny Jesus. He betrays him. He doesn't say, I don't know Jesus. He could have just left. Right? He could have left. But instead, he stays and he betrays him. He sells him out. Daniel Aiken sums up this passage when he says, some people find Jesus useful because of what they think they can get from him. Others find Jesus beautiful because they get him. And that's Judas, and that's Mary. He was willing to sell Jesus out. I can use this. I can use my status with Jesus for my own personal gain. And Mary's like, I'm willing to give up everything for him. And that's the same choice before us today. Will we sell out for lesser things? For 30 pieces of silver, for Turkish delight, for other lesser things in our life, or will we give it all to Jesus, bringing everything we have of value to him, which, by the way, is our very life. Bring it to him and say, it's for you. We've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Are you using Jesus now for some purpose? Or are you just excited to have him? That's a question we all have to wrestle with. 
Jesus finishes by saying, what she has done here will be told throughout the whole world. It's being fulfilled today. It's being fulfilled any time this passage is preached. People are hearing about the sacrifice that Mary made in this moment for her Savior and the good news that he offers. So we take him or leave him. The second way we see this is participate or pass in verses 12 through 26. Let's read it together. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples telling them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So it's time to celebrate the Passover meal, which was the most important meal for the Jewish people. The remembrance of God's deliverance of them out of Egypt, out of their slavery, and into eventually the promised land. And so a lot of preparation would go into this meal, and so the disciples are going to go and prepare it. It's similar to what we saw in Mark 11, back in January, where Jesus sent two disciples in to get the donkey for him to ride into Jerusalem. He sends two disciples now to go prepare this room for them, for them to be able to have and share this meal. Luke 22, 8 tells us these two disciples are Peter and John. So Peter and John go in to prepare for the Passover. And just like Mark 11... When those disciples go in and find this donkey exactly like Jesus had said, he gives them very specific instructions. This is who you're going to see. This is what you're going to do. This is what you're going to say. Maybe, again, it's Jesus showing his divine omniscience, that he knows everything, or maybe he planned this beforehand. Either way, it doesn't matter. They go in, and in verse 16, it says they found everything as he said. Everything happened, everything exactly how Jesus said it was going to happen. And it just always makes me wonder if the disciples, like Peter and John, are just standing there just thinking, how does he do that? Right? Like, that would be me. Like, how does he keep doing this? This is amazing. I, I thought, I think they probably asked that question a lot. But after preparations are made, Jesus shows up with the 12 at night, and they're ready to participate in this meal. And they're joined in this upper room above this house. Now, have you ever had one of those awkward moments at a dinner party, okay, where um, somebody says something that just kills the whole night? Or um, the host couple gets in a fight. Okay? Really awkward moment when these things happen. And if you're the one that caused the awkward moment, even worse for you. But this is kind of what Jesus does here. They're sharing this meal, this really important meal. Everything's going well. And he ominously says, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. One who is eating with me. Like talk about something to kill conversation. Nobody was talking about betrayal in this moment. One of you will betray me. Someone who's eating with him. And this comment is important because the chances are that there were more people eating the Passover meal with them in this room. But the 12 sat together and shared the meal together. So one of the ones who was eating with him is actually one of the 12 disciples. So it's not like, oh, the disciples could be, oh, it's one of these people on the outskirts of the room. No, it's one of us. It's one of the 12 that's going to betray him. They all start wondering, as we would, is it me? Is it me? And Jesus is not surprised by this betrayal, which is why he brings it up. In John chapter 6, we know Jesus knows that Judas is the one who will betray him. You'll see it on the screen. He says there, Yet there are some of you who do not believe. 
For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. Later on, it says, Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. Jesus knew when he chose Judas what was going to happen. We have to hit verse 21 here for a second. Okay? This is extremely important. It's one of the great mysteries in theology, one of the things that has caused debate and conversations and will forever until glory. We see God's sovereignty and human responsibility on full display in this verse. Because Jesus says in his sovereignty, God, this is God's plan. He says, the Son of Man must go as written about him. So God said this was going to happen. This was his plan. This was his decree. He would be betrayed. He would be handed over. He would be killed. It's the purpose for him coming. It's what the Old Testament was pointing to all along. And yet one of them, the one who betrays Jesus, Judas, has a curse on him. It would have been better if he had never been born. God's plan for sending Jesus to be killed on a cross doesn't mean Judas gets a free pass. He's responsible for his actions. He went to the chief priests. He said he would betray Jesus. He agreed to payment for it. He did all that. When Jesus said, in this moment, one of you is going to betray me, Jesus didn't feel good about this. Okay? He didn't feel good about this. He could have just said, well, you've been telling us all along you're going to die. So I'm just helping the plan along. All right, Jesus told them over and over again, I'm going to die. This is God's plan. This is what's going to happen. So why wouldn't Judas just get up and say, hey, I'm part of the plan? He doesn't do that. We find out later he eventually leaves the meal, mid-meal. The disciples don't understand why he's leaving. They think he's going to do something, give to the poor or something again because he's got the money bag. They don't understand that he's the one that's going to betray him. But he knows what he's doing. He knows he's responsible But again, it's this relationship, this great mystery of how do these two things work together. We should sit in these truths and it should lead us to worship. And it should lead us to want to follow God's will according to his word. That's what it should lead us towards. Not saying like, ah, well, you know, if I do this, God will work all things together. For the good, right? For our good, for for his glory. No, we should want to then follow his will that is clearly laid out for us. But if in fact we do something like a Judas, of course God can use it. Of course, of course God can use it for his purposes. But both of these through, at the end of Scripture, you don't have this little, you know, glossary that says, you know, here's what this is. Uh, let, me, let me tell you, neatly packed up for you to understand God's sovereignty, human responsibility, and how they work together. Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. Wish it did, but it doesn't happen. It just shows in Scripture that both of these things are true. Both of them are true. We're accountable for our actions, and God is sovereign. We need to wrestle with that. R.C. Sproul says, It is not as though God in his sovereignty coerced Judas to carry out the evil act of betraying Jesus. Rather, the sovereign God worked his will in and through the choices of his creatures. Judas did exactly what Judas wanted to do. But God brought good out of evil, redemption out of treachery. So this awkward moment has been thrown out. Somebody's going to betray me. They continue their meal. Not sure how things were going in that meal at that point. But then we get Jesus who stands up to continue the meal and he does something here that is now going, not an awkward moment, but is going to change the course of history. He's going to infuse new meaning into this meal that they're sharing at this point that's been shared for thousands of years before. And it's going to be a meaning that is far better. Passover celebrated for thousands of years, pointing to God's deliverance in the past, what God has done. And it was pointing forward towards when the Messiah would come. And in this moment, these disciples are looking at Jesus, who is the fulfillment of all of it. He's presiding over this meal. There's a distinct pattern that you would follow in the Passover meal, a way of doing things. Okay? And Jesus would get up, and at four different times with the cup, would start kind of this new point and this explanation of the meaning of this meal. Four different cups representing four different promises of God from Exodus 6, 6 through 7. And most scholars believe it's at this third cup, which represented the promise of God to redeem his people by his power, is when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. 
that during this meal, at this third cup, he would have gotten up knowing what this promise was for and instituted the Lord's Supper, what we will take in just a few moments. And he takes the bread and says, this is my body. And the disciples have heard this before. John 6, 35, Jesus gets up and says, I am the bread of life. And later in verse 51, you'll see it on the screen, he says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. It's not the first time the disciples have seen this comparison. And then after the bread, he takes a cup, and the cup represents Jesus' blood that will be poured out for many. That is the blood of the new covenant. The old covenant is over. The new covenant is here. Again, Sproul says that he believes it wasn't at Pentecost that the church was born. He says it's in the upper room at this very moment when Jesus says that blood is the new covenant that he will shed in just a few hours. The new covenant had come. So we need to understand how outrageous this would have been. Jesus is going far off script. Anybody else does this, they're going to get run out of town. But Jesus can do it because he's the fulfillment of it. They would have this routine, this discipline, and no one is expecting this to happen. But he's saying this is the last time that blood is ever going to be shed for you. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of animals have been sacrificed, and it ends now. In my blood, the once and for all sacrifice, as John the Baptist famously said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus is saying it's all culminating right now in this meal. So it's not bad to remember God's deliverance from Egypt going forward, but it was really just a shadow of what's happening, what was coming in Jesus. And then Jesus takes it a step further, and we can miss this because we often, as we talk through taking communion together, we, we sometimes don't get to this point. And it's where Jesus says that, um, truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it with you new in the kingdom of God. When he drinks it new in the kingdom of God, that this is not the last supper. There is a supper coming where we will sit with the sacrificial lamb, with our king, in eternity, with a feast that never ends. And that's something that we need to hold on to. That's something we need to hold on to. From this point forward, Christians are meant to remember this moment. That's why the church has been doing this ever since Jesus instituted it. And this is where we have a decision to make. Will we participate or will we pass? What does it mean to participate? Jesus says, you need to take it. You need to take it. This is my body. You need to drink it. This is the cup. This is the blood. This is the new covenant. They had to actively respond in this moment. And not just outwardly through motions of eating and drinking, but they had to understand that this represented truly the blood and body of Jesus. And that's what we do when we take it. Are we going to participate in this meal? Meaning, are we going to take it and are we going to let it change us? Are we going to remember what Jesus did and let it change the way we live our lives? Right now, most of you as you walked in this morning grabbed one of those cups. Right? You grab one as you walked in. You have every intention to take communion this morning. And you've been doing that for a really long time. Because you have decided, I'm following Jesus. I'm willing to sacrifice everything for him. And you want to gather with other Christians and take this meal together to be unified around the blood of Jesus. For some of you, you might not have taken the cup as you walked in this morning because you've never made that decision. And maybe you're watching online, you've never made that decision before. And then there's still probably others that you took the cup in, you plan on taking it, you've been taking it for a long time, and now you're sitting there thinking, should I? Should I? Am I selling Jesus out or am I actually sacrificing for him? Do I want to participate in this or would I rather have an easy life and let it pass by? But here's the thing, even in this moment, wherever you are, understand that you don't have to be perfect to take it. You just have to know that when Jesus stood up and said, this is my body, this is my blood, that it was enough for you. We sang that, Christ is enough. That's what he's done for us. And in this moment, you can take it today. 
the first time as a child of God. This meal was a chance to respond to receive the offer of new life. The new life only provided in Jesus. What would life look like today or tomorrow if you truly, truly lived out the reality that you've been united with Christ? Because that's what happens here. When he, his body and his blood are shed for us, it becomes our death and our resurrection when we believe. We have died. We have been risen. We've been raised to new life. So what would it look like if we actually understood what it means to be united with Christ? Here's how pastor and author Joe Thorne describes it. He says, As you examine yourself and find yourself to be sinful and in need of mercy, know that you have found it in Jesus. Come to the table, humbled by your sin and happy in your Savior. There you will find grace. That's what it means to be united to Christ, to recognize our sin and to be happy in our Savior. So the meal ends. We get this little comment that they sing a hymn and they go out to the Mount of Olives, which is a very important place we've talked about before for Jesus' ministry. And on the way, Jesus begins this whole betrayal conversation again. This point, again, as a disciple, I'm getting discouraged and frustrated. This last scene, we're faced with either depending on Jesus or disowning him. So let's finish up the passage, verse 27. You will all fall away, Jesus told them. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. Full of good news tonight, right? You're all going to run. You're all going to run. You're all going to scatter. You're all going to leave me. Jesus knows very soon Judas will come and hand him over to the religious leaders. He knows his time is short. We're going to see next week him in the Garden of Gethsemane for his last time of prayer before that. But he just told the 12 that one of them would betray him. And now they're walking and he says, hey, by the way, if you're not the one, you're all going to leave. You're all going to scatter. And the quote here is from Zechariah 13, 7. Jesus is saying that God will strike him, the shepherd, and his sheep will be scattered. Again, this is God's doing. Isaiah 53, it was the Lord's will to crush him. This is his sovereignty. This will happen. What else will happen? The sheep will scatter. And good old Peter stands up. Basically says, he would stand with Jesus even if those other guys didn't. If all the others fall away, I'll still stand with you. So he's either calling Jesus a liar or just that Jesus is wrong, which seems like a bad bet at this point in the ministry of Jesus. But that's what he's doing. And Jesus, knowing what's to come, knowing what's going to happen to Peter, makes sure that Peter knows not only will he fall away and scatter like the rest, but he will disown Jesus. And not just once, but three times. And not just that he's one of Jesus' closest friends and he'll deny that. He, He denies even knowing him. I don't even know him. And we'll see that story in a few weeks. And then Jesus says, truly I tell you. Now this is the fourth time we've read that phrase in this passage. This is the first time I'm mentioning it. Truly I tell you. Why would that be there? That phrase was a way of calling to importance what Jesus was saying. That basically this is going to happen. You can take it to the bank. right? And he says, you will disown me. Peter still doesn't get it. He doubles down. Let me show you how wrong you are, Jesus. Even if I have to die, I will never disown you. Sounds really good, right? Even if I have to die, Jesus, I will not disown you. And what happens? The rest of the disciples, we find out, just echo what Peter said. We're with Peter. We're willing to die with you. But I wonder if Peter and the other disciples heard the hope that Jesus had just offered in his comments. After quoting Zechariah 13, 7, Jesus says this, But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. It doesn't seem like much, except for the fact he's talking about his resurrection. These words are meant to be words of hope and comfort. Yes, I'm going to be killed. You're going to scatter, but I'm going to rise from the dead, and then I'm going to go meet you guys in Galilee where this all started. I'll meet you there. Why? Because he has work for them to do. He has work for them to do. 
And it's almost like they tune Jesus out here. They're just so upset that they would, they would flee from him, that they would leave him, that they can't hear the fact that Jesus is coming back. And he's got work for them to do, and he will meet up with them again. So instead of depending on Jesus' words and the hope that he offers, they depend on themselves. They rely on themselves and say, I will stand firm in this moment. I will die with Jesus. It's really easy, really easy to depend on ourselves. We can even admire here the resolve of the disciples to say, yeah, we're going we're gonna to stand here. We're going to die with you, Jesus. And I think if I went around, every one of us would say, I'm willing to die for Jesus. Followed by the other question, would you really? I mean, we could all say that in a moment. We could all say that in a moment. But that decision comes in the comfort of a Sunday morning without a like-minded Christian sitting around us in padded pews. Sure, I'd die for Jesus. It's easy right now. It's easy. It's easy for the disciples to say what they're saying right here. That I'll die with you, Jesus. I will. I'll stand with you to the end. But if we're honest, there has been little cost for us following Jesus to this point. What happens when hard things come? The disciples felt they could stand on their own, ignoring the words of the hope and the comfort of Jesus in this moment. James Edwards shows us that the rest of the disciples do, in fact, fall away. We see that, and we'll see that in the coming weeks. They betray Jesus in a different sense than Judas did. In verses 37 through 42, they fall away because of weakness. In verses 50 through 52, they fall away because of fear. And finally, in verses 66 through 72, they fall away because of pressure. If you are focused on yourself and your resolve, you will fail because you will have moments of weakness because we're finite, we're sinful, and we're broken. So when we're pressed, we will fail. Maybe not the first time, maybe not the second time, but we will eventually fail. If we are focused on ourselves and our resolve, you will fail because there's always something to fear. Maybe not our life yet. Maybe someday in the far future, we would fear for that. But our livelihood, our comfort, our status, those things probably will be threatened. And in the moment of fear, will we Give in. If we're focused on ourselves and our resolve, we will fail because we all give under the pressure. Maybe it's that relentless person in your life that has the barrage of questions of how could you believe in Jesus? There's no evidence. And you hear that over and over and over again for years and years and years until you finally just say, the pressure's too much. I deny him. Deconversion stories right now are a huge thing. You know, people deconstructing how how they've left the faith. And oftentimes you can point back to pressure. Pressure that they led them to rely on themselves and other people rather than Jesus. But if we focus on Jesus and his work on our behalf and what we re- remember in the Lord's Supper, we have hope to stand firm. We have hope to stand firm. Jesus knew, he knew that he was giving them hope in this moment, that he would come back, that he had stuff for them to do. He knew that the disciples would flee. He knew every single one of them would abandon him. Everyone was a traitor. But instead of rebuking him, he gives them hope. Why? Because Jesus came for traitors. He came for traitors. When we betrayed him, he didn't betray us. When we betrayed him, he said, I'm going to the cross. Romans 5, 10 For if while we were God's enemies, while we were traitors, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? He came for you and for me. He came for us as traitors. Will we depend on Jesus or will we disown him? Will we let the hope that he offers us, will we we let that take over? Or will we give in in a moment and disown him and take the easy way out? Remember Edmund. How does that story end up? I hope, again, you you know the majority of the story. But eventually he's rescued from the White Witch and he's brought to the Narnian camp and he meets with Aslan. And they have this conversation, kind of behind closed doors kind of conversation. Not really sure what's said. The White Witch comes, eventually shows up, And what is the first thing she says when she sees Edmund with Aslan? You have a traitor there, Aslan. Of course, everyone knew she was talking about Edmund. But if you read the story, we don't often talk about this part. 
But Edmund had got past thinking about himself after all he'd been through and after the talk he'd had that morning with Aslan. He just went on looking at Aslan. It didn't seem to matter what the witch said. Accusation's fine. He's a traitor. He betrayed you. And what does he do? He doesn't look at her. He looks at Aslan. Edmund was on the other side of Aslan as these accusations keep coming, looking all the time at Aslan's face. He felt a choking feeling and wondered if he ought to say something. Sounds like Peter, right? Like, I got this feeling I should say something. But a moment later, he felt that he was not expected to do anything except to wait and to do what he was told. He just went on looking at Aslan. It didn't seem to matter what the witch said. We cannot stand on our own. We look at Jesus. And the way Jesus said, look at me, is saying, this is my body, this is my blood, given for you. And we need to do the same thing. We need to look to him. The choice is for all of us this morning. We take him or we leave him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your perfect life in our place, your death on the cross in our place. You're rising from death, victorious for us. I pray that all of us are humbled this morning as we see ourselves and know we cannot do this on our own. That we are the problem, that our betrayal of you is real and it needs to be made up for, it needs to be atoned for and the only way for that to happen was for you going to the cross so that we could have hope this morning. And we do have hope. We do have comfort. And we have that comfort in Jesus Christ alone. It's in his name we pray. Amen.